You're listening to Frontlines, a podcast for the people that truly make mountain biking happen. Not the riders, racers, or product designers, but the builders, advocates, and the often forgotten board members of your local mountain bike trail association. Last episode, I mentioned that we'd be covering the e-bike topic this episode, and I was hoping to introduce that topic for our last episode of the year for our wrap-up episode of 2017. Yamaha Motors has requested that I delay releasing my interview with Drew Engelman. It was a great episode, and I'm hopeful to release it in the new year. My background is not in journalism, and I certainly didn't start this podcast wanting to be a journalist. But in many respects, that's what hosting this podcast involves. That said, I strive to respect all of my guests' wishes, and I want everyone to be able to put their best foot forward. And so, with that in mind, this episode will be a bit different than what you are expecting, but I think you'll enjoy it nonetheless. I'm your host, Brent Hillier, and this is episode 30 of Frontlines. In some aspects, this episode is a continuation of the wilderness discussion, and I feel that after coming out of five episodes on the topic, the correlation of what's happening around U.S. wilderness should be apparent. As I record this episode on December 7th, there's a federal land subcommittee hearing regarding the bill that would amend the Wilderness Act to allow mountain bikes. And Wednesday evening, prior to that, IMBA released a statement that I'm sure many of you received via email. If you haven't seen it, I've included a link in the show notes. Now, one of the reasons I was saving the interview you're about to hear is that I wanted you to hear it without relating it to wilderness necessarily. That's not because it's not fitting, but because what my guest is about to explain has so much relevance to so many land managers that your organization deals with, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't lost on just the wilderness designation. No matter what country you're in, you're likely to work with elected officials. And Bruce Alt is going to lay out his elected officials rule book for us. You'll be familiar with Bruce already. He helped us better understand national monuments, which just this week have made a big splash in the media with Donald Trump shrinking the size of some national monuments. All of the trail associations out there that I've seen make a stand against this, I just want to say thank you and continue what you're doing. I support you. Prior to joining IMBA, right after the Boulder White Clouds Wilderness Bill became law in August 2015, Bruce Alt worked as a lobbyist and certified association executive in several roles in two states and the U.S. Congress, representing the Forest Products Community in Mississippi, the Nature Conservancy in Mississippi, and the accounting profession in Arkansas. He also co-founded the Central Arkansas Trail Alliance in 2014 a chapter of IMBA in central Arkansas, and served as the group's first president. Bruce wanted me to make clear that the purpose of this discussion is to offer a very brief and simplistic policy analysis and political view of the realities surrounding mountain biking and wilderness policy today. This is not an examination of arguments for or against mountain biking and wilderness, nor is it a critique of past advocacy efforts undertaken by mountain bikers or mountain bike organizations. Rather, it is offered as a guide to mountain biking advocates as we all seek to channel our very limited resources for greater future success in achieving and protecting access for mountain biking. Our conversation today will explore some harsh political realities for mountain bikers and the untold elements of the designation of three wilderness areas in central Idaho in August 2015, commonly known as the Boulder White Clouds. Hi, Bruce. Welcome back to the show. Good day, Brent. Thanks for inviting me. I'm delighted to be with you. Can you give us an overview of the political reality related to uh, wilderness and mountain biking? In seeking to better understand the ultimate outcome of the struggle to oppose wilderness designation of the Boulder White Clouds and support a national monument designation, mountain biking advocates should first seek to fully understand the motives and political dynamics of the parties involved. And that understanding will help us maximize the effectiveness of our future advocacy efforts 
whether to shape future wilderness designations or develop a bike park and skills development venue for kids in a local town. Now, your listeners already know that the Wilderness Act passed in 1964 provides for Congress to designate wilderness areas. The process that results in congressionally designated wilderness in the United States is not very political. It is intensely political. It typically involves many different user groups of public lands, local, municipal, state, and federal elected officials, land management agency managers at both the local and national levels, environmental, wilderness, and preservation groups, business interests in the target landscape, outdoor recreation groups and businesses, and the public. It also occurs over many years and typically decades and is very complex. Designating a wilderness is also a public policy process because the target landscape is land owned and managed for the public by one of four federal land management agencies. So in simple terms, any public policy arena is a very crowded, hyper-competitive, and noisy contest. It's overflowing with victims and players winners and losers. Enlightened self-interest generally guides the actions of the participants, but numerous private and public purposes abound, many of which are difficult, if not impossible, to account for, much less detect. Every policy issue and legislative initiative has supporters and opponents. Successful advocates must be able to not only identify each, but more importantly, fully understand what their goals are. And so why should mountain bikers better understand what drives elected officials? Mountain bikers should care deeply about what drives elected officials when it comes to planning and conducting successful advocacy campaigns, especially those involving federal land protection, because a huge percentage of active mountain bike trails in the U.S. are on public lands. Elected officials are usually the ultimate decision makers in our mountain bike access contests. So let's begin by taking an admittedly overly simplistic view of what drives and motivates elected officials at all levels, from local and municipal to state to federal. And so for the purpose of our discussion today, there are really only three simple rules in the elected officials rulebook. Now this rulebook differs from the playbook, which ranges very widely from fundraising to constituent services, to campaigning, to enacting legislation. So here are the three rules in the elected officials rulebook. Rule number one, get reelected. All other rules and actions can be traced to supporting this number one goal. Rule number two, make as many friends as possible to help with number one. Rule number three is make as few enemies as possible so as not to complicate or threaten number one. So since Congress must pass any bill authorizing wilderness, it is imperative to understand that U.S. representatives have two-year terms and therefore have to stand for re-election every two years. In practical terms, they never stop campaigning and running for re-election. And even though U.S. senators have six-year terms, the same reality applies to them too. Fundraising for increasingly expensive re-election campaigns never stops either. What drives a wilderness group? What, what drives you know a conservation group like the Wilderness Society? What really drives them? The wilderness community has been forming, growing, and organizing since way before the Wilderness Act was passed. The Wilderness Society claims that since 1935, They have led the effort to protect 109 million acres of wilderness. In many ways, that gave wilderness advocates a huge head start over mountain biking, which didn't begin to organize until the late 1980s. The wilderness community numbers well over 150 local, state, and national organizations. For advocacy purposes, we should understand that it is really an industry and a huge one at that. Just one major national organization in the U.S. focused on wilderness expansion in the U.S., the Pew Charitable Trust, has assets measured in the billions of dollars. That's billions with a B. The Sierra Club claims 3 million members and supporters and also claims to be the nation's largest and most influential grassroots environmental organization. 
The Wilderness Society currently claims more than 700,000 supporters. Collectively, that's a huge asset base to compete against. But what drives this gigantic fundraising membership and advocacy machine? We could answer simply that it is passion, but that would ignore the real source of all their energy. Wilderness in the U.S. is regarded by these passionate followers as a religion. Expanding wilderness takes on the aura and fervor of a holy crusade. I once asked a diehard wilderness advocate who was a paid professional in Washington, D.C., how much wilderness would be enough? After over 60 years of advocacy, hundreds of millions of dollars spent, and nearly 210 million acres designated, how much would finally be enough? His reply was short and very poignant. He said, we'll let you know. In other words, the wilderness industry is absolutely dedicated to a holy quest that is insatiable. Wow. Give us some context then. Like, what would, what would you say drives the mountain bike community then? Well, the short answer has been more trails, more access, and continued access. Mountain bike advocates have a rule book too, just like at elected officials. And in order to maximize our effectiveness, we need to understand and practice four simple guidelines. Number one, numbers matter. Really big numbers matter a lot, especially to elected officials. They are charged with making decisions that benefit the most people and harm the fewest. And that translates into votes for getting elected or reelected. Think of the difference to them between seeing a community bike park meeting at City Hall packed to standing room only with parents and kids overflowing down the hall versus only a few mountain bike club leaders in the seats. Or written comments submitted on a local access issue in the hundreds for a small town, thousands in a small city, and tens of thousands nationally. Guideline number two, we need lots of friends and their active support to shape public policy. And that means hikers, walkers, runners, paddlers, rock climbers, other outdoor recreationists, and beyond. We have to think about and then act to build the biggest coalition possible that supports our goals. And that alone takes a lot of time and work. Guideline number three, we have to be present to win. Showing up early and being counted is critical. If we don't show up or show up late, we'll be ignored or severely discounted. And guideline number four, we must continuously cultivate champions. Successful lobbying efforts cultivate and grow elected officials who can lead the charge and wave the flag. We have to work hard to reward those who help us. This also applies to developing champions among our volunteer leaders as well. What can be learned by analyzing something like the Boulder White Clouds through the lens of that elected officials rulebook? Excellent question. To better understand why a national monument proposal failed and instead the White Clouds wilderness was successful, we have to analyze the outcome first in very cold political terms and be willing to be harshly realistic. To his credit, Representative Mike Simpson was absolutely persistent, reintroducing his wilderness bill in multiple sessions of Congress. He eventually formed a collaborative of multiple local interests to find a workable solution. Toward the end of that process, mountain biking interests got to the table only to be vastly outnumbered. The wilderness community had been working on this proposal for decades. Clearly, Representative Simpson wanted the wilderness designation for his state. That's called a political legacy. Senator James Risch is the junior United States Senator from Idaho. He previously served twice as the Lieutenant Governor and also the Governor of that state. To say that he understands Idaho politics and the voters would be an understate. Here's the proof. He ran for the U.S. Senate in 2008 for the open seat vacated by Larry Craig and won with 58% of the vote over his Democrat opponent who garnered 34%. That was a huge win beyond landslide proportions. Then in 2014, he ran for re-election, annihilated his Republican challenger in the primary, 
with an unbelievable 80% of the vote and went on to crush his Democratic challenger in the general election with 65% of the vote. In short, in 2015, Senator Risch walked on water in Idaho, and he really had nothing to gain by getting involved in the Boulder White Clouds wilderness fight until, until President Barack Obama signaled Representative Simpson that he had just six months to get the wilderness deal done, or he, the president, would designate the central Idaho mountain gem as a national monument using his authority under the Antiquities Act. Mountain bikers had worked to support the national monument because there was the slim hope that existing mountain bike trails would remain open in a monument. If the area was designated as wilderness, they knew the trails would be definitely closed immediately. And this is where it gets real cold. As for Senator Risch, there was absolutely no way that he would allow a Democrat president to barge into his state and get credit for anything, much less secure an environmental win that the Republicans had been unable to achieve despite years of effort. So he jumped on the wilderness train, fired it up, and tore out of the station with Representative Simpson and the wilderness community gleefully on board. Now, after all, the wilderness industry doesn't raise money, increase membership, and reward their champions by securing national monument designations. They win by getting more wilderness. So does anyone think that the wilderness designation will harm Senator Risch's re-election bid in 2020? Just scan the Idaho press now, two years after the wilderness was established for clues. And as for Representative Simpson, he easily won re-election in 2016, just a little over a year after the Sawtooth National Recreation Area and Jerry Peak Wilderness Additions Act passed Congress. That story pretty well covers the rule book. Get reelected, make as many friends and as few enemies as possible. Now let's take a real cold look from the mountain biking perspective. One of your previous guests candidly admitted that mountain bikers showed up late. We also showed up light. Here's what I mean. Senator Risch and Representative Simpson knew exactly who the wilderness supporters were, who the National Monument supporters were, and how their support or opposition would affect their own personal political fortunes. That's called political calculus. And members of Congress, their professional staff, and campaign managers are extremely adept at it. Mountain bikers were vastly outnumbered and out-resourced. As an interest group, we posed no threat or offered any significant adverse consequence to either Simpson or Risch. And even after the White Clouds Wilderness Bill passed, Representative Simpson published an article describing why mountain bikers should be pleased with the results, because the wilderness area was smaller than originally envisioned, and many more trails remained open to mountain biking than were closed. There's one very strategic lesson from this advocacy contest that we simply must embrace. Call it the 187 problem. In the summer of 2015, as the six month deadline approached and the wilderness proposal was gaining more and more traction, a nationwide action alert calling for mountain bikers to write their two senators and congressmen was issued. Mountain bikers were asked to argue for the national monument and against the wilderness and were provided with talking points. The result was that nationwide, a total of 187 letters and emails to members of Congress were recorded. Now, without being judgmental or critical, we should understand that 187 responses clearly illustrates an advocate's worst fears. Their cause showed up late, light, and without adverse consequence. To move the political needle on a congressional wilderness designation today we have to be thinking about getting a truly impressive number, perhaps 50,000. Numbers matter. Moreover, we have to show up early and bring both rewards and adverse consequences. What are the political realities that mountain bikers face right now? Elected officials are elected to make policy decisions that affect their constituents' well-being. They view private citizens as voters, friends, supporters, donors, enemies, or opponents. Their worst fear 
is a well-financed opponent who uses their own mistakes as campaign fodder. Never forget that the primary metric they use to gauge the risk or reward of a policy decision is the willingness and ability for people in each category to affect them and their prospects for re-election. So to be effective in a very crowded and competitive policy battle, any organization really needs three advantages. First, a motivated and informed grassroots army ready to engage. Second, professional advocacy support and direction. And third, the power to raise and spend money, typically through a battle campaign or a political action committee. Ranting on social media doesn't count for very much and only serves to divide and isolate. In contrast, pursuing litigation against an adverse decision by a federal agency or organizing a PAC and actively raising money to fund an opposition candidate draws a very high level of attention. Encouragingly, there are wins for mountain biking access occurring in many places today. But at the end of the day, elected officials look at any lobbyist like me or their clients and says, what you do speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you say. Well, Bruce, uh, thanks so much for, for taking the time to, to chat with me. And, and uh, I really appreciate you breaking this stuff down into, into really solid points. I think that's, uh, that's going to be really helpful for people. Well, I hope it's very helpful for all of our mountain biking advocates nationwide. We have a bright future, but it's going to take a lot of work. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. One thing that Bruce wanted me to correct was that he mentioned 210 million acres of wilderness in the U.S. And he actually misspoke there. That number is actually 110 million acres. Now, in the context of wilderness, my conversation with Bruce gives me a little bit less hope and a far more understanding as to why changing the Wilderness Act is a long shot, to say the least. And despite the last five episodes and points I've personally made, I still don't know what my opinion is. And as a rider, I'm kind of shocked to say this, but I'm grateful that most of the time, land managers here in Canada have the final say on which trails can and cannot be ridden on buy a mountain bike. It's certainly not perfect, but in some situations it can be easier to keep those decisions outside of a political machine, especially one like Washington DC. After my conversation with Bruce, I can't help but view my elected officials and how they relate to mountain biking differently. And it really drives the point home. Numbers matter. And when it comes to getting people on bikes, more should always be the answer. Shortly after I recorded this interview with Bruce, I had a conversation with Cooper Quinn of the North Shore Mountain Bike Association, and I don't think he'd mind me mentioning this. We started to take the rulebook template and apply it to other groups and individuals. For example, mountain bike media, the cycling industry, and land manager employees. I think it's a great way to kind of get some insight on how people that you're dealing with are functioning and what's going through their mind. And as Steve Sheldon, a former guest of the show, has pointed out to me on a couple of times, we need to learn how to speak their language. And I think that these rule books can help with that. It's something I'm continuing to ponder over. And if you have input, I'd love to hear it. As always, you can find the show on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find the show on YouTube and SoundCloud. You can send me an email or audio file to frontlinesmtb at gmail.com. With the e-bike episode being pushed back into the new year, you now have more time to get your comments and thoughts in, so please take advantage of that. I want to thank all those who donated to the show on Giving Tuesday last week. Your contributions are why this show can continue, and because of those donations, you can look forward to some updates to the podcast very soon. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so via PayPal. You'll find a link in the show notes, as well as links to the Central Arkansas Trail Alliance and IMBA's very recent press release. A reminder that you can also support the show by going to the book club page on the website. The latest recommendation comes from Bruce Alt himself. The book is The End of Membership as We Know It by Sarah L. Slotik. Click on the recommendation on frontlinesmtb.com slash book club. Purchase the book through Amazon and part of that money will go to the podcast through Amazon's affiliate program. 
What's great is after you've been linked to Amazon from the Frontline's website, anything else you purchase during that session, even if you don't purchase the book, Amazon will still provide the show with some of that amount. So do your holiday shopping and support the podcast. You can't go wrong with that. Next episode, we'll be closing out the year with our very first panel discussion of past guests. I'll be joined by Christine Reed of the North Shore Mountain Bike Association, Brennan Pack of the Ozark Off-Road Cyclists, and Jay Darby of the Mountain Bikers of the Central Okanagan. As always, music is by Lee Rosevere, production notes by Jennifer Pride. And finally, I'm Brent Hillier. This is Frontlines. Thanks for listening, and happy trails.